reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6. 2 Samuel obviously follows 1 Samuel. Chapter 6 and 7, the Ark and the Covenant. In chapter 6, we're going to look at the Ark of God and learn some lessons about that. The right way and the wrong way to do the work of God. And in chapter 7, we're going to look at God's covenant with David whereby the promised Messiah is going to come forth for the nation of Israel. So as always, we want the Lord to help us. He wrote the book. We want the author to be with us, to guide us and instruct us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand the word of God, your word in Second Samuel. Touch our hearts, help us to learn what you're saying here, the stories that were written, and how we're supposed to learn from them. Lord, help us to apply them to our own lives, lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask these things in your name, Father. Amen. Amen. David has now become king over all of Israel. He's waited a long time, since around the age of 16, when he was anointed to be king. And now at age 37, he is able to be king over all of Israel. And uh, he wants to establish Jerusalem as the capital for the religious uh, community, for the nation of the nation of Israel, for the Lord. And um, he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God there. The Ark was that little box, you may recall, that God had instructed. It's a little over three feet long. And uh, it had the cherubim over it. It was made of acacia wood and covered in gold. And uh, it had been taken by the Philistines. And it's been away from the home of Israel for a long time now. And uh, God wants to bring it back, and so does David. So the Philistines have been defeated, and it's time now for David to move the Ark of God to Jerusalem. But sadly, we're going to see that this author of so many wonderful Psalms doesn't apparently read the Word of God at least in this regard. And it's an example to us as well that we need to do things God's way. And so let's look at this interesting story beginning in chapter 6 and verse 1 of Second Samuel. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And how do I say that? Whatever you want to say. Uh, Ayo. Um, Ayo. Hey. Uh, Ayo <laughs> went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir woods, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nahans... Well, let's, let's stop there for a moment yeah. and talk about it. Yeah. We'll put that over there. Um, David wants to bring the ark, and he wants to do things in a big way. I would say a party of 30,000 is a big way, wouldn't you? So he's bringing 30,000 uh, men of Israel, and uh, David arose and went with all of them uh, to uh, Baal Judah to bring up the ark of God. And notice this, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. 
Now, the little box, as I said, was acacia wood covered in gold, two cherubim looking down on the mercy seat. In that little ark were the Ten Commandments. So they were really quite small. And uh, also a little manna to commemorate what God provided during the 40 years in the wilderness, and also the rod that budded, showing that Aaron was truly to be the priest of the nation of Israel. And so they call it the name. That little ark of the covenant is the dwelling place of God at that time for Israel. It is so holy and so sacred, they don't even call it the ark, they simply say the name. The name. The Jews, even to this day, if you uh, correspond with Orthodox Jews, the way Kelly does on Facebook and what have you, when they refer to God, they do not spell it G-O-D. As you know, they will spell it G underscore D. And when the scribes would be copying the law, or when they would read the law, and they would come to Jehovah, they would come to Yahweh, they would not say his name, they would simply say, and they bowed their hearts and their heads, the name. That's sacred to them. A lot of Christians get upset. You've probably seen it on my, my social media. Sometimes they'll get upset, and, underst- and I try, I'm respectful to my Jewish friends because that they, don't, they, don't, they can't say God. They, and so I respect that. You know, and people are like, I don't understand that. Well, there it is right here. <laughs> the, the name. So they just simply refer to the name. And the ark was in um, the Philistines' possession. It ended up in the house of Abinadab. And uh, so now they're going to get it because the Philistines are defeated. They can pick up the ark and bring it to Jerusalem. And so they have Uzzah and Ohio. Uh, or Ohio, however you pronounce it, the sons of Abinadab, they drove the new cart. And so here we have these uh, Philistines and they are bringing the ark uh, with David and his group over to Israel. So they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. So here you can picture, you've got a couple of oxen, you've got the cart, you've got the ark of the covenant on the ark, and you've got uh, these two sons, Ahio in the front, Uzzah in the back, David and all of his men are there, they're playing instruments, they're excited, they're worshiping the Lord, it's a wonderful time. And a lot of these instruments are mentioned by David in Psalm 150. He knew all about instruments, he made instruments, he used instruments, he worshiped, and of course wrote our wonderful Psalms. Uh, He's all about music, all about worship. Verse five, then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, harps, stringed instruments, tambourines, cisterns, cymbals, a wonderful, wonderful uh, time. And everything is just going great. This is a very high time. The ark of the God is gonna come back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, and it couldn't be any better until, verse six, and we, when they came to Nahon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obad, Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed, Edom, the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed, Edom, and all his household. So here we find that the party is over very quickly. The uh, oxen are moving along and they come to a threshing floor, which is just simply a raised stone in the the ground where they would beat the wheat against it, and the oxen stumble. And the ark begins to teeter and totter and begins to fall to the ground. And so what caring person wouldn't just reach out to catch the ark and make sure it doesn't crash onto the ground? And God strikes him dead. And David is angry with God. 
and no doubt doesn't understand why God's angry about this situation. Well, you need to read the Word of God. There's no substitute for knowing God's Word. And let's see what David missed. Now, the Word has been around for 500 years since God gave it to Moses. So David has no excuse saying, well, I didn't get the latest edition. No, it's been around for 500 years, and David should have known the Word. And again, you and I should know the Word many times better than we do. Exodus 25 and verse 10, this is what God gave to Moses regarding this Ark of the Testimony or the Covenant. Exodus 25 and verse 10, the reference is in your outline. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So you will not touch the ark. That's why we have these poles. They shall always remain there. You'll use the poles, lift them up on your shoulders, two men, one in front, the ark, one in the back. You do not touch the ark. And God goes on further in Numbers chapter 4 to give more instructions about this. Oh, the trouble we have because we don't read the word of God. Amen. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 5 of Numbers. When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his son shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put on it a covering of badger skins and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue, and they shall insert its poles. Talking about now we're getting ready to move. You take the covering of the tent down, now you put the poles in the ark, getting ready for people to carry it on their shoulders. And verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Koath shall come to carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of meeting, which the sons of Kohath are to carry. So God has designed that uh, out of the tribe of Levi, the family branch of Kohath will be the ones who will carry the furniture, nobody else. So God's very specific. You will not touch the ark. You will use the poles. Nobody can carry it but the sons of Kohath. That's been in the law now for 500 years when David's on the scene. What does David know about that? Apparently nothing. Well, maybe he did. If he did, and he ignored it, that would be even worse, wouldn't it? I can't believe he didn't know. Well, then if he, if he knew and he did not care, that would be much, much worse. I would rather ascribe to David that he did not know. But maybe he did know and thought, I know more than God, because I've done that and so have you. We all think we know more than God at times. In any event, if he did, uh, now there's no indication in David's life, incidentally, that he was a student of God's word. There's no indication that he studied the word. He didn't have any schooling of any sort. All we know about David was that he just loved God and he wrote these songs and uh, these poems. Uh, but it, there's no indication that he was a student of God's word at all. You and I need to be students of God's word. And that's why I really prefer that we read through the Bible in a year. Uh, find a good online program. We used to have them here, but they're online. Uh, you can do it audibly too. But get into the Bible every day. It doesn't take more than 15, 20 minutes. You listen to a little Old Testament, a little New Testament, a little proverb, a little psalm. In one year, you go through the whole Bible. And so David apparently didn't know, or Kelly thinks he did know, and must have... Well, maybe he been, didn't. I don't know. Who it's, knows? It's In any just... event, he didn't follow it. Now, not only did they... What was it touched not by the poles, but touched by a human hand. But also, it was not a son of Kohath. It was apparently uh, a Philistine who covered it. And so you need to know God's word, and you need to do it God's way. And even um, if he didn't know it, he, 
It's God's words are written into the universe. He had already put it into place. Well, and uh, he, he, he should have known the, the value. It's easy to play uh, some Monday morning quarterback here, but he knew how important the ark was. He knew about the law. All the Jews at that time, even now, know about the first five books of the law. He could have gone in there and looked at, studied it out and said, what does the Ark of the Covenant require? How do you carry it? What do you do with it? It was all right there for them, but he didn't pay attention to it. Lesson for us, check on God's word. See what God has to say. Don't assume. And then, when God gets angry and takes an action and kills this man on the spot, what does David do? Instead of being remorseful and humble and repentant, it was his fault because he orchestrated this and it did not come about the way he wanted. He should have asked God's forgiveness. He gets angry at God. So here we see clearly that David, like us, is human. And we're much the same way too. We do things and it's not God's way and it doesn't turn out well for us and then we're angry at God. And that's why I have the lesson here. Our way leads to sorrow. God's way leads to joy. And this was a man that, remember, this is a man that the Bible says he was a man after God's heart. Sure. And, and God loved him and loves him and he'll use him again in the future. In the millennium, apparently he'll have a very high position, perhaps as king over Israel under Jesus, to be sure. Uh, and he loves us as well. But there's no excuse for ignoring or disobeying God's word. You have to do it God's way. So what does he do? He parks it uh, in this other household for a while at Ob Obed-Edom's house. Obed-Edom apparently has enough brains not to touch the ark. And what happens when the ark is there? He's blessed. I was going to say, I'd like to, of God. I would have loved to have been in that house for three months. Yep. You know the blessings that would come? That's like the Holy Spirit, you know, the, is, the Lord was right there. That's right. I mean, he was in that house. So let's go on now to verse 12 and see how we get out of this pickle. Now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. So we now see that he was, I don't know that he forgot about the ark, but it wasn't first on his mind. He had to be reminded about the ark. Oh, by the way, the ark is down there at Obed-Edom's house and he's being mightily blessed. Ooh, well, let's go ahead and get it. Well, we can assume now that he must have gone into the word to see how do you do it properly. And that's much like us as well. We do things wrong, what do you do, give up? No, you go back and see how do you do it right. And that's what he's done. Apparently he's doing it right. And now he's doing something uh, to show his Great love for God, the, his anger is over, God's anger is over. Now we're gonna get that ark brought the proper way, verse 13. And so it, was, so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Every six paces, bam, you're gonna to have to kill a, an oxen and a sheep. What a, what, a, what a deal that was. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Now that word dance is uh, whirled about. He's whirling around like a whirling dervish. He is so excited about uh, this event. David is very You know who he reminds person. me of? My Ari. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a very emotional person. David is very artistic. Swings around and around and around. around. He, he's very, very, he's just whirling around like a dervish. Uh, verse 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal. I did some research on that to see how you pronounce that in the Hebrew. And it's, I've been pronouncing it Michael? wrong all these years. I, I've always said Michael. It's Michal. 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 No, but it's maybe Michal. Michal. Kind of like Michelle. Yeah. Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So here she is. Now, she's the first wife that he had, Saul's uh, daughter, and um, they're, they're childless uh, by her, and... Um, she sees him and she is embarrassed and she is judgmental and she's critical. 
And uh, she is just, she thinks he's making a fool of himself. And he's just loving the Lord. That's right. So verse 17. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Then he distributed it. Oh, I'm sorry. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. And so here we see that he's uh, declaring a feast. Incidentally, uh, I pay attention to food. Hey, I love food. And I pay attention to food in the Bible to see how they ate. <coughs> and there was a wonderful book many years ago, about 50 years ago, I read it by Elmer Josephson uh, about keys to health by looking at the Bible. Elmer Josephson, you might want to just Google that. And uh, something about uh, health and the Bible. And he goes through all the references to the Bible on if you follow biblical use of food, especially around the life of David, you'll see how they ate and it's all very healthy. Meat, incidentally, was not an everyday deal and it sure wasn't a six ounce or eight ounce piece of steak. It was a special occasion. A visitor came, um, it was a feast like this, but, uh, but raisins, bread, and uh, everything from the earth. Wonderful. And that's a key to, to health, the experts tell us now. So David is being very generous. He's, he's, the people are just so happy with him. The ark is being brought into the city of Jerusalem. He has erected his own tabernacle of some sort. It's not, it's not a big building, some kind of a tent structure, probably the original tent's been destroyed by now. But uh, let's go on and see the problem he has in his own household. Verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. So he's blessed the people. Now he comes home. It's good to be home. Good to bless the family, right? <laughs> and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So there's, uh, welcome home, honey. How was your day? Uh, she's not happy with him. No. Notice how she doesn't talk about... Uh, the eyes of the people. The eyes, the eyes of the, of the men. Talks about the eyes of Sounds the men. Sounds like jealousy. Doesn't that sound like jealousy to you? Yes. Yeah, talking about the young ladies. Uh, you're like one of those base fellows who shamelessly uncovers himself. Now here you're talking about the king of worship. The king who, his first job was to be writing and uh, singing to uh, Saul and to the Lord about God's praises. And he is just so excited about worship. And to, you know, to go to against anybody because of their worship is wrong, but to go against somebody who is the king of worship, if you will. I mean, when you think about any songs written from scripture, 90 plus percent probably come from Psalms. And uh, this, this man was, was instrumental in really tuning us in on how to worship God. And he is so excited, he's whirling around, he's not naked, he does have the long linen ephod of a priest, why he's wearing that, I don't know. He's not a priest. In any event, she is embarrassed. So what does that tell you about her attitude towards him and about the attitude of her towards the Lord? The way you're worshiping God offends me. And she she's, call, saying, she's calling him base. Yeah, you're one of the base fellows. That means like low life. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a real low lifer. Low. And so what, what does David do? He doesn't say, yes, dear. Verse 21. So, so David says to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, the Me Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So she goes after him for being shameless and uncovering himself. And he wasn't. He just had a long white linen ephod from uh, head to toe. And uh, now he's going after her and saying, hey, 
God chose me, not your father. And um, so there's a little bit of domestic uh, a action going on there. And uh, yeah, oh, by the way, you don't like it, uh, you're going to hear a whole lot more of it. Uh, many, many years ago, when my mother first got saved, she'd sit in the kitchen at the house and listen on a radio to R.W. Shambach, who then was located in Pennsylvania. Remember R.W. Shambach? Yeah, oh, sure. And oh, it was a very poor reception. And she'd put her ear right next to the, to the little um, radio with the antenna up, and try to get the best angle. And then uh, Dad, her, her husband, would come on in from uh, watching television and go to the, uh, the kitchen. And it seemed like he came more and more often just to annoy her. And uh, so he said, I, I'm sick and tired of your talk, listening to that religious stuff. So did mother say yes, dear? Mother said, if you knew her, you better get used to it. You haven't seen anything yet. So uh, she just went ahead and, and uh, listened more and more. And he eventually got saved and uh, joined our, our, our ministry here as co as associate pastor. But uh, don't let somebody put you down because of your worship. Don't let somebody put you down because you love the Lord and because you worship the Lord in a way that they don't approve and, of. And I think the lesson in here is also she dishonored her husband. Yeah. And we have to be very wives. We have to be very careful of that because, you know, um, I try to tell my kids when sometimes when something goes wrong, you know, we have to look at that whole situation, right, and be very careful that we don't dishonor Jerry or dishonor whatever. I had to learn that the hard way. I was not always like that in my life. I learned that really through a lot of preaching and a lot of long knowing now. Even when we disagree with someone, whether it's a father, a pastor, or a husband, we have to be very careful because God does not want us to shame and dishonor these, our husbands or our fathers or whatever. And I, I'm still trying to get that message across to, to people all the time. <laughs> like your parents, yeah, well, they wasn't the greatest father. I get it, I do, I get it. But we have to be careful, be very careful of dishonoring. I knew someone recently, and maybe someone will know this story listening to me, um, who recently came to me, and I got to tell someone the story. I know all these bad stories. Um, I knew this family that I lived in, in Clifton Park, and um, uh, the father apparently, when I met him, he was a neighbor, and he was in his 80s. Apparently, he was not a good father, and um, m ran around in the mother, and it was not a good situation. Now he aged, and things are different, and he's a good way, he seems. I saw the way he responded to his children and seemed like a good grandfather. Of course, he grew up, right? He changed, probably. Whatever. Anyways, the daughter used to go there all the time, and I would hear her stories, and she'd go in the house, and maybe there would be something that would go on between the mother and the father, or, and uh, she would complain about it and talk terrible about him. Then I heard that she would tell him to go blank off and block block and block block and just terrible stuff. And I was kind of like really taken back on that because I just couldn't understand someone talking to their parents like that. And then I heard from her what a horrible father he was. Well, one day um, she was killed coming down the road. And I was really upset. She had three kids. And I immediately asked the Lord, why did you take her life? And I'm telling you, I heard in my spirit, she dishonored her father. I went to the church and I told my pastor and we were all very sad. We all knew the story about this girl. But she was blatant, blatantly dishonoring her father. And I never forgot that. And some of those other lessons. So my point is here, he, you can see that she dishonored her husband and she lost the blessing of having children. That's right. God uh, shut up her womb, or, or else David didn't go near her again. But in those days especially, it was a curse not to have children, and um, she did not have any. And the interesting what you say about uh, honoring your, your parents, where in the Bible does it give you a formula on how to live long on this earth? Does God ever say, avoid meat, or uh, exercise daily? or be kind and have a good spirit, have a sense of humor, you'll live longer. All the things the experts tell us you need for long life, God never mentions in his word. I'm not saying they're wrong, 
and I, I love the Blue Zone, Robin and I, I've watched that and others have too, about the different ways to live along. You know, watch what you eat and exercise and have a good disposition, have family and friends. All those things can work, but God never talks about those at all, linking them with long life. He only gives you one link to long life. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon this earth. So do all the other stuff as well, but honor mom and dad. And uh, let's get into the last part of our message here. David wanted to bring the ark into Jerusalem. He finally got it there. Now he wants to build a temple for God, wants to build a magnificent house for God because he, David, has a magnificent house himself. So chapter 7 talks about the covenant. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around that the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more, as previously." Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. So here we see his desire to make a house for the Lord. And in verse 2 it says, uh, The king said to Nathan the prophet, or let's look at verse 1, Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. What a great thing it is to have rest, isn't right. it? Right, oh my goodness. But the king said to Nathan the prophet, and uh, now in those days, the Holy Spirit did not indwell believers. That came about in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, he would come upon them for a time, and then he might leave. And that's why David said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We don't need to pray that because he indwells us and remains in us. But in those days, if you wanted to hear from God, generally God had a prophet who was the spokesperson. Samuel, now it's Nathan. And uh, Nathan is the man to go to. And so the king goes to Nathan to say, let's get this thing before God and get it underway. And so verse 2, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside ten curtains. What's Nathan's mistake? Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. What should he have done? He's right off the top of his head. He's telling, this is what, this is what God wants for you. Go for it, buddy. He hasn't talked to the Lord. I learned this from my mother. It frustrated me no end as we were starting this ministry and uh, she was going to God for everything. And I was working more in the flesh and the natural. And I said, what do you think about this, mom? How should we do this? How should we do that? You know what she'd always say? Always. I don't know. I will ask the Lord and I'll get back to you. <laughs> I don't know. I'll ask the Lord and I'll get back to you. And so we, we dropped the matter and days would go by. And I'd long since even forgotten the, the question or the problem. And she'd say, I just heard from the Lord and he said to do thus and such. So that's how she operated. And that's how Nathan should have operated. 
He should have said, I don't know. David, I'll take it to the Lord and I'll let you know when I hear. Good lesson for us as well. What do you think we ought to do about so-and-so? Well, let's Google it. Let's see how the church down the street does it. Let's see how pastor so-and-so does it. Now, maybe they're being led by the Lord and maybe that would be good for us and maybe it wouldn't be good for us. Go to the Lord and say, how do you want to handle it? And don't be afraid to say to somebody, I'm going to pray about that and I'll get back to you when I hear from the Lord. So Nathan makes a mistake and he says, go do it all in your heart. Now, God's not upset with Nathan, but now God's going to tell Nathan what needs to be done. You go and tell David, uh, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house? I've never wanted a house before. I've never asked for one. I've never needed one. Uh, and then he goes on to say, verse 10, and here's a wonderful promise. We all have Jewish hearts. And we want to see Israel settled in the land. Here's a promise for Israel, yet future, verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. That's so wonderful. You claim that promise for Israel as you pray for her, that they're not going to have to move anymore. They're not going to be oppressed. They're not going to have these attacks that they're going through now. Um, but of course, it's going to be with the Lord Jesus in control. Verse 11. Since the time that I command the judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. Okay, now it gets into the real heavy prophecy. No, I don't need a house from you, David, but I'll, get to, I'll tell you what, I'm going to build you a house. A house like you cannot believe, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. All right, now here's the prophecy coming about. And prophecies often have dual applications, sometimes three applications. And this one goes back and forth. You've got to watch it closely. He's going to be talking about the seed coming from David's body who will be King Solomon, and also the ultimate seed coming down the line, Messiah, Jesus. He will establish his kingdom. So he's not wise. And this is a promise that God made to Abraham. I put that in your bulletin. It won't take the time to get into it in Genesis. In the several locations, God promises in a covenant with Abraham, from you will come kings. And referring to the kings of Judah. Now watch this closely. Here's the prophecy. It talks about near-term fulfillment in Solomon, long-term fulfillment in Jesus. Let's read verse 12 again. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Forever. I'm sorry, go ahead, this kingdom. That's talking about Solomon. Now verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it's going to be, Solomon's going to build the house, but the throne is going to be forever under the Lord Jesus. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. That refers to Solomon. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed be from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Through Jesus. According to all these words and according to all this vision, know Nathan, so Nathan then spoke to David. So that's the promise that from you, David, will come my son who will rule and reign forever, Messiah Jesus. That for those who are looking for the coming of the Messiah from the line of David, this is your scripture, this is your promise. And that's why Matthew opens his gospel with the lineage of Jesus, tracing Jesus birth on up through the line, through Solomon the king, to his father David the king, promise fulfilled. And that prophecy, incidentally, is the, that lineage rather, is the lineage of not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but Joseph, the stepfather. Because Mary has her lineage in Luke. Mary can trace her lineage back to King David, but through King David's son, Nathan, not the Nathan the prophet, but Nathan, who never was king. So Jesus has no right to be king of Israel through Mary. That's why God had to find a man who would be able to fulfill that promise for Jesus. He found Joseph, who had the lineage to go back 
through Solomon to David. And had there been kings at the time of Jesus' birth, Joseph might have been king over Israel, but they didn't have any kings at that time. And I was thinking today on my walk about the fact that both Kelly and I had the privilege of having other men raise us than our biological fathers. Her biological father didn't raise her, nor did my father raise me. God chose other men to raise us, stepfathers who adopted us. That's very important. What kind of a man would you choose to raise Jesus? Mary, of course, was a godly woman. We honor her, no question about that. What kind of a man was he? And with all due respect to Mary, who was working with him at home like mothers with sons, once he got old enough to go to the workshop and work as a carpenter, which he was, who was he around most of the time? Who was he watching? Who was he emulating? Who was imprinting himself on that man's life? I owe so much in my life to my pastor, more to my stepdad, and you to your beloved father, Sam. And so Joseph is wonderful, and I look forward to shaking his hand when I get to heaven. Well, let's get on to uh, David's response now. He's so grateful. Wow. Say, thank you, Lord. They're going to be kings from my line forever, and he's excited about that. Verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, and you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the matter of man, O Lord God? Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land. Before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever, and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now for, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Is there any doubt in our minds about why God loves David? Look at how he praises. He blesses Israel. All right, so he forgot about the, uh, the word about the ark. He's going to make other mistakes as well. But he loves God. And he loves God's people, Israel. And so we can look around and see people that we know are believers or say they are, and we think, well, how could God save that person? I see things they're doing wrong and what have you. And again, as we're pointing those fingers, we got some fingers coming back at us. But you don't know their love life with God. You don't know their hearts with God. So we can't judge people. We're not called, well, all we're called to do is to share our faith in them. This man loves God. This man not only loves God, he honors God and he follows God. And with that, you can't go wrong. So the lesson, I think, for chapter 7, God's promise of Jesus was for King David, but it's also for you and for me and for all mankind. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this word, Lord. We see how important Israel is to you, Lord, and how important God's people are to you. Lord, help us to be people of, of faith. Uh, help us to seek you with our hearts and help us to be known as men and women who seek after you. We love you, Father, and we praise your name. Thank you for this word. May you seal it in our hearts and may we cha be changed by it. In your name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. These past
Blessing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out.